evening and welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. My name is Andrea Judici and I am your host and I'm your guest tonight too. I enjoyed being here so much. Last time I asked myself if I would come back and I answered yes. And I have with me my guide dog who for his focus and our safety as a team, I choose not to use his name. We are now on another episode in our series, Pup, or excuse me, Person and Pup to Partners. We've talked about a lot of the stages that happen. We've talked to, to a puppy raiser about how the puppy gets ready to be a guide dog. We've talked to a guide dog instructor about how the puppy learns what it is to be a guide dog and wear a harness, and what those commands and that work means. We've talked to a mobility instructor who's explained the reasons why someone might choose to get a guide dog or might choose not to, and the training that one needs before they're really going to even be ready to consider working with a guide dog. And I talked about what it's like to get ready for and go to class to get a guide dog. So we're sort of following this path. And as I was thinking about this series and this episode, I realized that there's a lot about having a guide dog and being in a guide dog team that I really wanted to talk about. So before I invite the last sort of piece of um, the guests for the last piece of my series, and, and um, that will be people who have guide dog, dogs that were bred and raised to be guide dogs, but did not have that as their career. And so they have a career change and are either working in a different career or their career is to be a pet. And also to have a discussion with other guide dog users about why they chose to become a guide dog user, what about the guide dog lifestyle works for them, and what their experience was. I realized that I really, really want to talk a little bit about what it's like to be partnered with a guide dog. Once you've gone through class and, and the, the beginning and the, is, is, is behind you and you're now on the journey together, and to reiterate some of the things that I know I've said lots and lots of times on this show um, in different episodes about how all of you in the public can help my guide dog and I to work more effectively and efficiently and safely together. It, I was always told that it takes about six months to a year to really, really cement the bond that will be what you have going forward from that point on with your guide dog. And it's true that by the time you leave class, whether that's two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, by the time you finish your training, whether it's at a residential program, living in the dormitory at a guide dog school, or if it's in the community, you're living at home and you're training in your own community with your guide dog, by the end of the formal training, you've got a basic level of trust. You know that this dog has been trained well, it knows its job, you know that you know the basic commands that you, in fact, can speak the correct words to get the correct response. But there's not a lot more than that. I sort of, I sort of in, in an attempt to explain this new beginning relationship to people, I, I like to think about it like a new coworker. At first, you don't know each other at all. And then you sort of maybe say hello when you're at the, you know, walking past each other at the water fountain or at the coffee pot in the, in the you know, lunch room. But it's really not any more than that. You know they do their job well, you respect that they work for your organization and you think they're great that they're there, but you're, you don't have a lot in common other than that. And then slowly as you have those conversations, you start to perhaps eat lunch together, talk about things that mean a little bit more, but there's no outside of work. You don't have a friendship yet. And then all of a sudden, as time goes on, you realize that not only is this person a coworker, but they become a friend and you're sharing confidences and you're doing things on evenings and on weekends and you're sharing family time and you're having holidays at each other's houses. And that's sort of a a sort of silly, but um, possibly relatable way to explain how this relationship builds with a new guide dog. In the beginning, we don't think we're all that in a bag of chips for each other. We respect each other. We understand that... I have a role and he has a role, but the trust and the, 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 the intensity of their bond takes a little bit of time to develop. And, and most guide dog schools will tell you it's, it's six months to a year. That is not a, a formula. Sometimes it happens faster. Sometimes it happens almost instantly. Sometimes it takes even longer. Not that you don't trust your dog, as I said, but to have that special level of connection. Once that's there, 
it's such an intense, amazing experience. I struggle constantly with word, with finding words to describe what it's like. And people say, well, is he your best friend? Well, um, we're closer. We spend more time together than I do with any other living creature in my world. Uh, people will say, well, is it like having, you know, is it, is it, do, you, do you love him more than your family? Do you love him more than your boyfriend? Do you love him more than your brother? It's so hard to say because the relationship I have with a guide dog is not like any relationship I have with a human. It's, it's much more enmeshed. My guide dog doesn't feel like a dog that is separate from me and lying down here by my side. And my guide dog feels like an extension of my body. Like my left arm has suddenly gotten longer and furrier at the end. Longer than my right arm and much more furrier. Um, I don't know what it's like to be a sighted person. I don't know what it's like to have eyes that, that work appropriately for using for vision. But I do know that this doesn't feel like a pet or a best friend, or a anything. The, the, the relationship you have, that I have with a guide dog is different from anything else, and it's very hard to explain to someone who hasn't had that relationship. Um, and it's in no way saying that the relationship that people have with their dogs that aren't guide dogs isn't important or valid. I'm not in any way saying that. But it's, this is a very different relationship because when we're together and I pick up his harness handle, I'm entrusting my life to him. And thankfully, most of the time, there isn't a life-threatening situation that we encounter. But absolutely every time I pick up his harness handle, I am saying to him by picking up that harness handle, I trust you to keep me safe, to keep me alive, and to see for me. And that's a huge, huge thing, relationship. It's, a, it's an amazing learning experience to trust another living creature that way, especially since most of the people that I encounter don't know their right from their left. They have all sorts of other things on their minds because they're people busily living their lives. They may be more likely to forget to indicate to me that there's an overhead, that I'm going to bump my head on a, um, a branch or that there's a curb, or that there's a narrow space and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bump my arm on a doorway as I walk through it. That's not because they're flawed or because they're not a good sighted guide. It's because they have not gone to, they have not been bred and raised and trained their entire life up to being partnered with me to do nothing more than to see for me. That would not be a, a healthy relationship to have with a human. This guide dog lying next to me, he isn't thinking about the homework that he didn't do or the test he's worried about tomorrow morning or the meeting with his boss that he's dreading or the clients that are coming in tomorrow that he really wishes he didn't have to meet with. He's not worrying about the shopping list or the gro or the, his in-laws are coming over or he's got out-of-town friends that are coming and he knows when they're there. It's a lot of work. None of those things are on his mind in addition to helping me navigate safely through the world. So having said that, and at the beginning of this show, I started with how can all of you, all of you watching this show, all of you who might encounter me and my guide dog or any other person in their guide dog, how can you help us as a team and the guide dog do their job better? And you might be saying, well, how, how on earth would I possibly be able to help? You just got through saying the dog does all the work, so I don't need to help. Well, on one level, that's true. Because as a team, we work together. We have a, a vocabulary, a communication that works for us. But there are a lot of things that can disrupt the flow of how we work together and can interfere with our ability to communicate and or my guide dog's ability to do his job most effectively. And most of the things that can interfere are things that people do completely inadvertently. I know that none of you out there would intentionally disrupt a working dog, cause a blind person to be in danger because of something you did. You would never like push a blind person down a flight of stairs or push them in front of a car. That, that is a horrifying thought. What a lot of people don't realize 
is that by acknowledging a guide dog in any way, that means making eye contact, waving, calling to them, bending down to speak to them, petting them, acknowledging them in any way, potentially causes them to be distracted from their work. They have been trained to ignore people. He knows he's not supposed to pay attention to people, but if someone uses his name or is like, hey, Dougie, Dougie, that's, it's very hard for him to ignore that. He's very social. He was raised and trained to be very, very social and to love people. And so if someone is, is going to interact with him and he happens to lose his focus, even for, I, I know you'd never lose your focus. In case he happens to lose his focus for a very short moment in time, the potential for me to become very hurt is there. Most of the time, if he does get distracted, it's at, a, at, it's at a moment in time when there's nothing happening in the environment that's putting me at risk. And thankfully that is true. However, I will tell you that I have had people dist- actively distract him when I'm standing at the top of a flight of stairs, when I'm crossing a five lane intersection. Those are times when his, if he were to become distracted, I am very, very much in danger. The top of a flight of stairs, I could very easily fall. Crossing a street, I could get hit by a car and die. And I know that this probably sounds very dramatic and, and possibly that I'm being over dramatic as you're listening to me have this conversation with you. But I beg and implore you to remember that while my dog is very cute and this particular one is an outrageous flirt, he will... If, if he senses that you've got a willingness to make eye contact with him or you think he's pretty cute, he might, he might try to play on that. Um, that's not a failing on his part. It's just part of his personality. But that's why I need for people to really recognize that even though dogs are cute and, and they have waggly tails and beautiful eyes and wonderful coats and they're very much, many, many people are dog lovers, that when a guide dog is at work, it is absolutely my eyes. It is no longer a dog. It is my eyes. And you would no more walk over to your coworker and be like, oh my gosh, you have the most beautiful eyes here. May I take them over here and give them a carrot or a cookie or a piece of cheese? No one would do that. That would be crazy. But when you, when you interact with a guide dog, and, and I truly mean, when I say interact, I mean acknowledge. It's sometimes people think, well, I didn't, I just touched him or I just petted him or I just said good morning or I just waved across the room. All of that is interacting. That is treating this animal next to me as a separate animal, not as my eyes. And when the harness is on his body and he is out and about and working in the community, he is my eyes. So imagine walking down the street and you're walking along, you're doing just fine. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, dropping over your eyes is is a blindfold, just drops out of the sky, falls over your eyes. I can imagine that that would seem very alarming and very disorienting. And you would be afraid and you might even be frustrated and angry that that had happened to you. That's another way of thinking about what happens if you interact with a guide dog when they're working, because by having a guide dog, I don't feel blind anymore. I don't, I don't proceed through the world as if I'm blind because I have this highly trained professional who sees for me. But if that highly trained professional is distracted because someone is trying to pay attention to him, that's like having a blindfold put on. I get to be blind all over again almost. So, okay, I've harped on that point quite a bit and I do apologize for being long-winded about that, but it's, it's, I just cannot tell you how important this is. I cannot tell you how every single day, and I'm not exaggerating, every single time I am out in public with him, somebody interacts with him in a way that potentially could distract him and potentially could become a problem for me. And I try very hard to be patient, and I apologize if you happen to be one of the people who maybe caught me on a day when I wasn't feeling patient, I try very hard to be polite and to ask people to please not interact with my dog. I also will tell you, as amazing as it is, after someone gets through saying, hi, doggy, and I say, oh, please don't talk to the dog, their next statement to me is, oh, I don't. I didn't. I know I can't talk to them. So I realize that 
sometimes when we see a dog, they're cute, we love dogs, we, we are sort of our, everything turns off except for the, oh my gosh, it's a doggy. But I, again, ask everyone to really consider if you're in the grocery store or you're in a place where you really don't ever see dogs, the likelihood is the dog that's there is doing a job. You may not understand what that job is. You may not be able to look at the dog and know what the job is, but go with your first instinct that if the dog, if, it, if, it's, if we're not at a pet store and we're not at a park and we're not in the vet's office, which are all, all places that you might encounter my guide dog and I ask you to do the same thing, but it, particularly when you're someplace where there isn't dogs typically, please, please try to overrule your, your immediate instinct to interact with them. Some of the interesting things that happen as you bond with your guide dog and as you go on is that the, the guide dog is absolutely the responsibility of the person who, who the dog is issued to. So unlike, we talked about this last week, last month, unlike a family pet where, you know, whoever gets around to it or you trade off and everyone feeds the dog and everyone takes the dog out, the guide dog is absolutely the responsibility of the person it was issued to. Having said that, guide dogs are off duty when they're at home. He's not a guide dog when he's at home. He's just a dog. And he has relationships with my family, people that he is so excited about seeing his, his you know, my, my mom and my brothers and my dad and all the, oh, my, my step parents and all the people in my world, my grandmother, my close friends. These are all people who become part of his pack. And as such, they're people that mean a lot to him and they're very important to him and he's important to them. And so as the relationship with the guide dog develops and you become more and more bonded to your dog and they become more a part of your daily life, your family also becomes attached to the dog. Not the same way, but they do. And interestingly, I was talking to a friend of mine and we were talking about how it's really hard when the time has come for the dog to retire because it's not as... as devastating and and just gut-wrenching an experience that is for the person working the guide dog, it's also a very difficult experience for the people who've become close to that guide dog, the other people in my world. It's not just me experiencing the retirement of my guide dog, it's my family, my friends, the people who love him who are experiencing that loss as well. And while I recognize that, and it's very hard. It also can be hard because just like any other loss, you're processing your own grief and yet you need to be able to help the other people around you with that grief as well. So a guide dog, having a guide dog isn't, isn't an, a, a solitary or um, sort of individual experience because all of the people in your world become a part of, all the, the people who are close to you in your world become a part of the life and times of the guide dog that you're working. Unfortunately, guide dogs don't work forever. I think they should. I think that would be fabulous. I am on, this is my sixth guide dog. One of the things that people sometimes say to me when I'm working him and perhaps he does make a mistake, he forgets about something, he, he doesn't um, stop at a space that's too narrow and so I bump my arm and we have to go back and do what's called a rework. So I show him what the I, I tap the item that he bumped me into, like this, the chair, um, as we're walking through a restaurant, and I say, oh, no, you know, and, I, and, and then we go back, and then he has the opportunity to rework that and do it correctly so that he can reinforce um, the correct behavior. Unlike a um, machine that, that hits the shelf and it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it works just as well if you turn it off and don't turn it on again, or your cane, if you put it in the corner, a guide dog is constantly having their training reinforced. So if you don't work a guide dog, they are able to, they, they are going to lose the training that they have. It's all through positive reinforcement. And that means that if something happens and he does forget something or make a mistake, it's important that I correct him and then rework that so he has an opportunity to do it correctly. And he'll remember the positive, he'll remember the praise and how he did it right and then he won't make that mistake again or not for a very long time. Um, so we were, people will say to me, well, I, I thought he was trained. I thought, I, you know, and I'll say, well, he, he is trained, but haven't you ever made a mistake at work? Like, haven't you ever forgotten to, you know, 
do something in the appropriate fashion. When people see a guide dog doing something that's not absolutely perfect, the assumption is somehow that I'm still training him or he hasn't, he hasn't been fully trained. And the reality is that guide dogs are alive. So he's going to forget things sometimes every now and then, especially in the spring when we've had a long winter and the squirrels start running around again, he will have a moment where he'll see a squirrel run right across our path and I'll go, ah, squirrel. And they'll go, oh, guide dog. I can't do that. I can't look at that squirrel. Um, if we are someplace and there are a lot of dogs, and this is another thing that's really, really important. Yes, he is a guide dog. And yes, he has been taught to ignore animals, squirrels, rabbits, dogs, cats. However, if I'm walking along and someone has their dog on a long leash or unleashed and they let their dog come running up to him, that is very, very difficult for him to ignore. He will try. Unfortunately, a lot of people have dogs that they, well, it's not unfortunate. They have dogs they love to have play with other dogs and that's very fortunate, but the, they unfortunately forget that when my dog is working, he's not really wearing his dog hat. He's wearing his eye, his, his, uh, his hat that, that says, I'm a guide dog. I'm the eyes for my human. Therefore, letting a dog approach him, letting a dog interact in a way that will distract him, not only is it very, again, dangerous for me and impolite, it actually has become against the law in the state of Connecticut. If your dog, in, if you allow your dog or you as a human intentionally cause the distraction of a guide dog, that is a, that is a misdemeanor. So not only is it something that Andrea feels strongly about, but it's something that enough people feel strongly enough about that we've started to have some legislation to help manage that particular situation. The fact that he is a dog and he's not a machine means that he will occasionally have a day where he's sick. And so maybe he can't work that day or he might have a problem and, 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 uh, maybe, you know, I've had, a, I've had a situation where my dogs have, you know, gotten sick in the grocery store or gotten sick in some, one of the public places. It's not ideal, but I would be willing to bet that anyone who is a parent or has spent any time with young children or even not young children have probably had them not have the best day and possibly get sick in a place where you'd rather that didn't happen. Um, it doesn't mean he's a bad dog. It doesn't mean he's a bad worker. It means he's alive. And just like the rest of us, he is not a perfect machine. He is a perfect living creature who has moments where he has perhaps not the best situation going on. So the retirement that I was referring to earlier, unfortunately does happen again. This isn't a machine that I can just recharge its batteries endlessly or buy it a new battery and it will go on and on forever. So some guide dogs work what would be considered a full career. Um, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retract that statement. I don't like that statement. Ideally, a guide dog will work on average six to eight years. And that would be considered a typical working life for a guide dog. That puts the dog between eight and 10 when they retire. Some dogs will work until they're 11 or 12. I have a friend who's working a dog that's 14. The dog is happy, enjoying her work. So we never know for sure. Just like there are people who don't retire till they're 92. Um, so most people retire sometime between 65 and 70, 75, but some people, they retire at 40 and some people retire at 90. So um, unfortunately, because of either health or stress because this is an unbelievably stressful job and some dogs are just get so stressed out by the responsibility that they have that it causes some secondary physical condition and more often than not because of a dog attack or a negative dog interaction some guide dogs retire early and early can be anywhere from, you know, once a guide dog is graduated from the program, they are working. So anytime between that and, 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 you know, 522, that's what I keep telling him. He's going to work for 30 years. I keep telling him that. Um, so while we all hope for our dogs to work that wonderful 10, eight to 10 years, that would be great. The reality is that not all dogs do. I have been working a guide dog for 30 years. I have a friend who's been working a guide dog 
for 60 years. We are on the same number dog. She's on dog six, I'm on dog six. So she's got a few dogs in there that worked for 10 or 11 years and I haven't gotten that yet, but that's okay. It's not that there's anything wrong with the program that trained the dog and then there's not anything wrong with the dog that didn't work as long as, as another dog. Um, that is, if anything, the biggest flaw in the plan of working with a living creature as your partner. I don't get as attached to my cane and it doesn't do for me as good a job as the guide dog, but it doesn't have to retire. I have the same cane now I had when I was in college. I haven't grown any taller, so that's really what makes your cane change is if you get taller. And since I stopped growing taller, that, uh, that cane can just get a new tip every now and then and off we go. So that is an absolute plus if you want to look on one of the reasons that sometimes people choose to use a cane and not get a guide dog is because that cane is not going to retire. And if it does, if it does have some sort of catastrophic episode and it gets run over by a car, or it gets you know stomped on by a horse, um, you're not usually so emotionally attached to your cane that it's a devastating experience. So why did I choose to come here and interview myself again? It really is to ask for your help to ask for your help in keeping your dogs on leash and under control and attended at all times. It's to ask for your help to totally, totally ignore a dog that is working and, and ignore when you hear the word ignore, see, don't pet, talk to acknowledge, pretend the dog isn't there. It's to understand that if you happen to encounter a guide dog and a, and its human partner, at a moment when the guide dog may have possibly made a mistake or, or, or somehow our communication is broken down and we're reworking something, it's not that the guide dog is bad or untrained or needs to go back to school. It's simply that something broke down in our communication and we need to redirect ourselves and get ourselves back on track and get that situation and that moment in our journey to be executed correctly so that we can continue on and do that correctly in the future. And I ask you to respect the incredible amount of training and time and love and financial commitment that went into my dog and in all guide dogs to let them do their work. I want to thank you for watching, as I see it, A Blind Woman's View. I promise as much as I enjoy being interviewed here, I will not be my guest next month. We have a couple of more episodes to go in this series person and pup to partners. I'm so grateful that you've all watched and I hope that you've learned something and I hope to run into you on, this, on the streets of the town of West Hartford. Have a great evening. Thanks so much.